Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Martha from Martha Is. Today's video, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the books that I'm planning to read in February and March. So I've tried to move away from doing monthly TBRs. I find uh, that if I get too prescriptive um, about the books I'm gonna read, I rebel against myself. <laughs> I feel like hemmed in and rebel against myself, which is really says a lot about me. But um, yeah, so I kind of need to, I like to have um, some structure sometimes, um, but I also need to kind of leave myself choice, a certain amount of choice and freedom. So that's the case, why am I here with the TBR video? The reason why is that despite that, I end up creating TBRs for myself by signing up to challenges and buddy reads and requesting books from publishers and et cetera, et cetera. So then I basically end up having signed up to things that I have to read by a certain point. So it's really my own fault, but never mind. Um, so in terms of the books then that I am going to be forced to read <laughs> in the next two months, that's terrible. I'm not forced to read them because they do generally all look really good. Um, so the first one is I Am Halfway Through Emma by Jane Austen. Um, I did, uh, I did. I decided to do a buddy read of Emma by Jane Austen with my friend Joe from Instagram. We started last month um, and because there was a new film coming out on Valentine's Day, that was why I wanted to do it now. I have seen several film um, and TV adaptations of Emma and, um, and of all of the Jane Austen books actually because my mum was a really big fan of Jane Austen so I watched a lot when I was younger. And that does create some issues in that I sometimes struggle to read books if I've already seen an adaptation of it because the story's already in my head, I know how it's going to go. So then I kind of just get a bit, eh, there's nothing, there's nothing new here, there's nothing exciting. Um, that said, I think I still do really want to try and read Jane Austen's novels particularly because I do really love the stories. So Joe and I read Northanger Abbey um, last year and that was really great and we then buddy watched the um, TV adaptation which I loved as well. Emma is interesting in that there's a bazillion different adaptations actually. So as I've been going through in my head, I've been thinking, oh yeah, well I think that person was really good out of the Kate Beckinsale adaptation. I think actually that person was better for this character out of the Gwyneth Paltrow adaptation. Um, and to be honest, the new film, I'm looking at it being like, well, I don't recognize half the actors. And then the other half, I'm like, there's some odd choices, but hopefully it will be good. Um, if you saw my last video, which is my January wrap up, you will know that uh, I was trolled by my Kindle um, when it came to David Copperfield. It is an 800 page book, but it told me it was only 300 pages because it has basically, I think, converted very, very large pages um, into Kindle format. So it can take you an age just to read one page. And that is very demotivating for someone who doesn't like to spend too long reading a book. Anyway, the exact same thing has happened with Emma. I opened it, it said it was 265 pages. I go on Goodreads, Goodreads says it's 500 pages. And I'm like, eh, okay, here we are again. Um, but at least I knew that going in. So I've been able to kind of recalculate the percentages because that's the kind of nerd that I am. Um, I am struggling a little bit because I don't like to spend too long reading a book. I get a bit kind of bored, I get a bit antsy. Um, and I, part of me does wonder if Emma was published today, whether or not an editor would just get hold of it and cut half of it out because there's just a lot of very rambling conversations. There are several characters that really like to waffle. Um, so in that sense, it's a little bit wearying, but I am over halfway through now and I'm determined to stick with it. I feel like if I gave up at this point, because I am happy to DNF books, I feel like if I gave up at this point, I would feel like I'd been defeated by this book on my Kindle that is trolling me. So I'm not going to. Let's move on, because I've spent like 100 years talking about the first book in my list. Second book, then I'm gonna have to read it alongside Emma. I've signed up to a buddy read with um, my friend Emma from, yeah, that's helpful, another Emma. Emma from Instagram. And we are going to read The Shipping News by Annie Proulx. So this is one I actually have no idea what it's about. Emma is doing a list of 40 books that she wants to read before she turns 40, which is really cool, or in the year she turns 40. Um, and so this is one of them. So this is actually, look, it's really cool. This is one of the fourth estate matchbook classics. So you can see, look, it's designed to look actually like a matchbook. And you open it up and it's got like a flap. And I'm guessing I can use this as a bookmark. 
which is quite cool. Um, so I bought the whole set, and let me, I've got it here on my lap. <sighs> so this, yeah, it's really cool. It's, you can see here, and then it's, I'm probably not gonna be able to do this one-handed, but it is literally a matchbox. Let's see if I can pull it off and show you. Yeah, so you can see, look. So I think that's a really cool pack of books. Did I buy it because it was a really cool concept? Yes, I did. I hadn't heard of the majority of the books in here, but you know, that's a good way to find new books, guys. So um, another one that I'm gonna probably be reading in parallel um, is this one. So this is a reread. Um, I am part of the a book club on Instagram where we're reading all of Daphne du Maurier's novels um, chronologically. I can tell you the first three are terrible. They've got these really hideous male protagonists that are just generally awful, awful people. And they, as far as I'm concerned, they don't get enough of a comeuppance at the end. Spoiler alert, sorry, they're just awful. Um, and then you get to Jamaica Inn and that's when you start getting like a female protagonist and there's a lot of atmosphere. Um, and then you hit Rebecca, which is the best one. And I don't know what that means for the rest of the book club because there's loads more to go after this. Um, but yeah, this is a reread for me. I, re -re I read it for the first time, I think in 2016 or 2017 and absolutely loved it. Like I was reading it whilst walking home from the tube station and reading while walking is actually quite challenging. I don't do it very often, but I just could not put it down. So I'm really looking forward to rereading that. Another one that I want to try and get to probably in February is this one, um, She Lies in Wait. So this was very kindly sent to me um, for review. So I'll read you the blurb. On a hot July night in 1983, six school friends go camping in the forest. Bright and brilliant, they are destined for great things and Aurora Jackson is dazzled to be allowed to tag along with her older sister. She never makes it home. Thirty years later, a body is discovered. DCI Sheens is called to the scene, but he already knows what's waiting for him. Aurora Jackson, found at long last. But that's not all. The friends have all maintained their innocence, but the body is found in a hideaway only the six of them knew about. It seems the killer has always lurked very close to home. Lurking. So that, that sounds cool. I think that's actually been chosen for the Richard and Judy book club. And I did... I used to love a bit of Richard and Judy. I remember I bought... A bulk of like a you could bulk buy the whole of like one of their season picks and I did that not long after I'd got back into reading and it was really good because I it just exposed me to a whole lot of different types of books I would never have tried there's a lot of thrillers Richard and Judy tend to be quite thriller heavy but um I at the time didn't really read a lot of thrillers so that was quite cool I think I discovered The Ice Twins by S.K. Tremaine and The Kind Worth Killing I think I think both of those were Richard and Judy, or at least one of them, and they are two of the best thrillers I've ever read. So there you go. Love a bit of Richard and Judy. Um, what have I got next? So the next two I have are where I've signed up to um, not two, three. The next three are where the reason I have to read them by a deadline is because I'm going to see the authors speak about the books. Um, I tend to go on these kind of sprees where I just book in a load at once. Um, and yeah, I really enjoy going to see authors talk about their books and I think it really enhances the reading experience. I tend to try and read the book beforehand if I can. Sometimes obviously they're doing a talk because it's not been published yet or has only just been published. Um, because yeah, I think it's really good to kind of read it and come with your own thoughts and then listen to what the author kind of says it and how they'll position it. So that's really exciting. So the first one um, is one I have ordered but has not arrived yet which I'm very excited about which I know is going to sound weird when you see what it is um, it's a book called Me and White Supremacy so this is a book um, that a lot of people have been talking about on Instagram particularly one of um, one person I follow called Book Buddy Reads who's a good friend this book I think is really designed to interrogate the idea of white supremacy and white privilege and try and help I think it's positioned at white people to try and help white people kind of work through it. Like, I think there's kind of a workbook element of it. I hope I haven't made that up. Um, but to kind of work through it and really sort of understand the different um, different things, different ways it can manifest, like uh, like the white saviour narrative, um, white guilt and things like that. Um, and it's really timely in there's been a lot of controversy around a book called American Dirt, 
which um, I will try and find a good place that summarises the controversy and link it down below. Um, but essentially it's a book where it's not written, it's about um, characters trying to immigrate over the border from Mexico to America um, and it's not written by a Mexican person and that's ignited a lot of conversations about the importance of own voices and own voices representation because this is a woman who has had like the full force of the marketing world you know publishes budgets behind her to see this book um you know Oprah chose it and things like that and it's a book that a lot of um Latinx and Mexican um reviewers and bookstagrammers have said is actually giving really really damaging stereotypes really harmful negative racist stereotypes so and I think and then there are I think a lot of kind of other people who have read it and think it's a really amazing book and so I think it's really timely to read a book like Me and White Supremacy to kind of examine um, how you, how, you know, how I as a white person would react to um, listening to people of colour talking um, and how I kind of evaluate situations, how I might use my privilege to help um, raise awareness and things like that. So that's a lot to put on one book. <laughs> but like I said, I've heard some really good things. And I think it's just really important to read about these kinds of things. So I'm, I've ordered it. I hope it will be delivered soon and I will be picking it up as soon as possible. Another one, the author that I'm going to see is We Have Always Been Here by Samra Habib. Nope. Yeah, Habib. Um, and Samra Habib is a queer Muslim woman. So she grew up in Pakistan and then um, arrived in Canada as a refugee before escaping an arranged marriage at 16. When she realised she was queer, it was yet another way she felt like an outsider. So this is a memoir about that, and it's called A Triumphant Story of Forgiveness and Freedom. So I got this from um, Queer Book Box, which is a subscription service. Um, they'll send you a book a month, which is uh, an LGBTQ book, either you know, about that story or by an LGBTQ author or both. And it's sourced from Gays the Word, which is um, an LGBTQ book, bookshop in London which I love so if you're in London go to Gaze the Word definitely um the next one uh, of the authors I'm going to see is this one The Wolf of Baghdad um so this is a graphic memoir I was gifted this by my lovely husband when we were in um a comic book store in Brighton and this one really grabbed me because um so I'll read you the first part. So in the 1940s, a third of Baghdad's population was Jewish. Within a decade, nearly all 150,000 of Iraq's Jews had fled. Of those remaining, most escaped in the 1970s or were killed. Today, fewer than half a dozen remain. So Carol Isaacs um, is basically visiting Baghdad. And it's about that and thinking about her, her heritage. And um, yeah, so show try and show you some of the artwork so it's quite it looks quite um sort of sparse i think so i don't think that would be a particularly long read i was really so i was really attracted to that because it occurred to me that um we're not really taught a lot um or certainly when, when i was at school we weren't taught a lot in the uk about um about the rest of the world i mean come it was basically kind of a we're great britain done um so I did learn about other religions, um, but not in any great depth. I learned about some other countries, but again, not in any great depth. And it occurs to me that when you have such a kind of superficial level of um, information given to you, it's really easy to kind of silo things. So, for example, when it comes to religion, if you say, you know, Jews and Judaism, you think about Israel. Um, if you think about Islam and Muslims, you tend to think of places like, uh, you know, maybe the Middle East think about Hinduism, think about India, for example. And so it's just, you get these kind of very siloed set associations. And when the actual fact is that there are people of all religions living all over the world, all with lots of different experiences. So when this one was talking about being, you know, the Jewish heritage in Baghdad, that didn't, that's something again, that had never really occurred to me. Um, you know, Baghdad and Iraq have quite sort of negative connotations in the UK because of the Iraq war. And so it's associated with things like, um, you know, Islam, Islamic extremism and the Taliban and things like that and again that's all from the kind of Islam association um, so the idea of like Jews in Baghdad would never have occurred to me and so I think that's really interesting to, to learn a bit more about that 
and then go and see the author speak about it as part of, I think it's Jewish Book Week. I think that's right, beginning of March. So then the last three that I need to get to um, in February and March are all books kindly gifted to me um, by publishers. Um, and they will all, I think they're all coming back, coming out in March. So this one, Conjure Women. And look at, this is a pretty cover. So Conjure Women um, by Afia Atakora. So I'll read you the synopsis. After Miss Maybell died, they said the river swelled up fit to weep for her. Living water, it swallowed up the old, proud stalks of cotton. And Miss Rue, the only one left to sustain her mama's curse, found herself afeard of what the river water might dredge up. Secret things, better left hidden, that haunted her, a curse that might rise to the surface. So this is Fourth Estate. Um, the publisher is Fourth Estate. The back of this proof copy says it's out 16th of April 2020, but I thought I saw somewhere else it says 17th of March, so... Who knows? It's out soon. Um, next one is this one. And another in look at this. Just look at it. It's all like shiny. Um, yeah, it's amazing. So this is um, The Recovery of Rose Gold. And this is uh, published by Penguin Michael Joseph. And I received this through the Bookstagrammer Summer Bash last year when publishers very kindly gifted us a load of proofs. This one um, actually doesn't have a synopsis, but I do. But I remember reading about it, and it's essentially, um, I think it might be based on a true story, maybe. Um, but it's about a mother and daughter, um, who I think the mother has Munchausen's by proxy. I think, and Munchausen's by proxy is a, a psychological disorder where so Munchausen's is a psychological disorder where you essentially. Um, fake illness to get attention to get attention but like to quite an extreme degree so you might for example take medication that's going to make you ill um, or fake illness in order to kind of get the attention of, of being ill so whether that's you know the attention of people around you or hospitals or the media or whatever Munchausen's by proxy is um, is that but where you are getting the attention because someone else is ill so I think that's more common in parents and children so the parent has the Munchausen's by proxy and it's the child who is ill so I think in this case Rose Gold is the daughter um who whose mother has kind of always I think her mother has always told her that she's ill um I think this book is essentially a, so it's called The Recovery of Rose Gold and I think therefore the book is almost yeah the book is saying that the mother's already been found out. That's kind of the start. And so this is about the daughter's recovery. And I think um, the mother may be coming out of prison. Something like that. You get the vibe. Um, but I think it's supposed to be very good. I've heard very good things. And then the last one I have, um, which is another uh, proof copy from Fourth Estate, is My Dark Vanessa. So this one... And this is cool as well, because this is signed. Um, this one, I think, is going to probably be a very difficult book to read. Um, it's, I think, quite sort of... Well, I don't know if polarising is the case, but possibly a bit con possibly controversial. So the synopsis of this, essentially, is um, about grooming, I think, and sexual abuse. So... The blurb is, Vanessa Y was 15 years old when she first had sex with her English teacher. She is now 32 and the teacher, Jacob Strain, has just been accused of sexual abuse by another former student of his. Vanessa is horrified by this news because she is quite certain that the relationship she had with Strain wasn't abuse. It was love. She's sure of that. But now, in 2017, in the midst of allegations against powerful men, she is being asked to redefine the great love story of her life, her great sexual awakening, as rape. Nuanced, uncomfortable, bold and powerful and as riveting as it is disturbing, My Dark Vanessa goes straight to the heart of some of the most complex issues of our age. So yeah, I guess this is talking about kind of the, the complexities of grooming and consent when you are under the legal age of consent. Um, so that one, that's quite a one to finish the video on, isn't it guys? Um, that one I think is probably going to be quite a difficult read, but I've heard... 
some quite good things. There's good things even the right thing to say. I think it's impacted people who've read it. So I want to see. I want to see for myself. Um, that's all of them. So that's quite a chunk. So how many is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then me, that's nine. And I read nine books in January. So this is nine books across ten. Well, nine and a half. So half of Emma. Um, across two months. So it's definitely doable. Um, it's just whether or not I then get rebellious and just say no I don't want to read them all we shall see um thanks for watching everyone let me know um if you've uh read any of these books if you didn't like them please don't tell me um let me know what you're reading in February and March do you guys do TBRs do you not do TBRs do you just sort of pick as you like um yeah I'd like to know what you're reading and um, please give me a thumbs up if you like this video hit subscribe and I will see you again for another video bye